Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Fairsey, and I have the privilege to serve as the inaugural Hicker Family Professor in Renewing Democratic Community. Welcome to the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. So growing up, my grandmother taught me that there were three things that you should never discuss in polite company. Politics, religion, and money. So today we're gonna to discuss all three. Sorry, Grandma. So on this Good Friday, that is also during Passover week and the month of Ramadan, we bravely enter the arena of discussing religion and politics in the United States. And when discussing sensitive issues, it is helpful to have an expert in understanding how politics and religion intersect in American life. And today we are privileged to have with us Professor Michelle Margolis. Michelle Margolis is an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. She studies public opinion, political psychology, and religion and politics. Her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation and appeared in numerous outlets, including the American Journal of Political Science, the Journal of Politics, the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, Public Opinion Quarterly, Political Behavior, and of course, Religion and Politics. Her book, From Politics to the Pews, published in 2018 by the University of Chicago Press, won the Distinguished Book Award from the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion. Our format today will be that Dr. Margolis will make a presentation. Then after the presentation, I will invite her to center stage to have a discussion of her work. And in the last half hour, we will ask for you uh, to bring your questions. So, please join me in welcoming Professor Margolis to the stage to discuss from politics to the pews how partisanship and political landscape shape religious identity. Okay, can everyone, everyone can hear me? Okay. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's, it's truly an honor. Um, the book, in some respects, I, I, I sort of feel like I've left it behind because I, and as, as I hope in our discussions, we can talk about religion and politics more broadly and you can hear, um, uh, and we can talk about some of my, my ongoing research. But actually when preparing to come here, I re-remember that this is actually very important in 2023 American political life and, and kind of more so than even when I was working on this book and when it first came out, I think. Um, and so uh, please, uh, if you have, if I'm not making sense, if you have any clarifying questions, please raise your hand, let me know. We're a small enough group. You can even ask me a substantive question. Definitely, definitely let me know if I'm talking too fast. I get excited when I talk about these topics, so just let me know and I'll keep track on time so I don't go over. So a key part of political science research is studying how salient social identities matter for creating cohesive political blocks. So we can think about this with race, we can think about this of ethnicity, class, but also religion, right? And scholars have studied this relationship between religious, religious variables and how they shape political variables, right? And in particular, this strand of research has really focused on how people's religious identities and their religiosity affects things like their partisanship, their vote choice and their policy attitudes, right? And when we think about someone like, we're gonna take Ronald Reagan here as an example, we think about how that came to pass. So it started with Ronald Reagan, but it certainly continued to be on him, that we see this close connection between organized religion and conservative um, and conservative religious beliefs, that it's the first time we started seeing this kind of umbrella coalition of religious Americans coming together for political 
um, for political purposes, as opposed to it being the Catholics are Democrats, the Protestants are Republicans. Reagan started advocating for policies that religious Americans in, in general cared about, started using religious rhetoric when reaching out to religious voters, and aligned himself with overtly religious organizations for political gain. Right, and so consequently, the story that we tell ourselves is that once this happened, once the political landscape changed so that there were these elite cues telling us where the party stood on questions related to religion, that religious people became Republicans and less religious people became Democrats. I will, I talk about this later, but let's just caveat that for this, I largely mean white Americans, okay? And I'm happy to talk about non-white Americans as well, but in this case, this is a story, this is about white America in particular. Okay, we can update it to today, right? You look at a picture like this, I hope the, the images are coming out right, and you, think, you might take from this people who are praying a certain way, these folks are also wearing Trump hats, right? So that there's something about these types of Christians or that devout Christians rallied around Donald Trump, that it was that there's something about their religious beliefs and their values that are pushing them to support someone like Donald Trump, right? And so the conventional wisdom, if we take those three images together, we kind of have two pieces of conventional wisdom, right? Which is first, that we think of as religion and religiosity are fixed, that they're these stable characteristics that we sort of receive in our DNA, we get from our parents, and that they're stable and unchanging. And second, that they're affecting politics, that they are producing a change in people's partisanship, their vote choice, their political attitudes. So the goal of the book, um, and, a, and a goal of kind of the a big strand of my research agenda is kind of just throwing a wrench in these conventional wisdoms. And so, what I hope to convey in the book and what I hope to convey to you guys today in the, next, in the next bit of time we spend together is that religion and religiosity are in fact changeable. So that's like thing number one, so just like hopefully I convince you of. But two, that politics is one of, not the only, but one of the things that can be producing this change. So if I can get you to believe one of these things, great. Or I guess if I can get you to believe this, Great, hopefully I'm getting you to believe both of these by the end. And so the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the theory that is underlying the book, um, and then we'll, I'll keep track of time. Hopefully we'll get through two pieces of observational evidence. So the book is made up largely of experimental and observational, but for today's audience, I thought I'd stick with observational, and then I'll wrap up with some conclusions, um, but maybe we'll skip the second observational depending on time. Okay, so the first part of the, my argument is that to say politics affects religion, that's a really bold claim, right? And I was saying this at lunch with some of the, the wonderful grad students here at Syracuse, that my advisor is a bit of a, a naysayer. When I first started working on this project, he's like, okay, well, how and why and when, right? When theoretically would we expect politics to exert an influence on religious decision making? And that we don't expect it to be all the time, but that we can generate some empirically testable, testable hypotheses based on, on literature that's out there. So to do that, I'm gonna talk about two strands of literature, both very big literatures, and I'm gonna talk about each of them in like two minutes each, right? But the first we're gonna talk about is the sociology of religion and the religious socialization literature, which in short talks about how in childhood you're socialized into religion. You don't have much say about whether you go to church on Sunday, whether you go um, have, to, have to attend religious school. You don't really have much in the way of control. But then once you get to adolescence and young adulthood, a lot of times people become less religious. Sometimes this is an act of rebellion against your parents, but a lot of times it's also much more passive. It's just, it's not a priority. It goes on the outskirts. This is a time when people are making decisions for themselves for the first time. They're becoming independent. They might go off to college. They might be entering the workforce, right? They just have other priorities. And scholars of, of uh, sociology scholars have noted that, well, I guess two things. One, not everyone declines in their levels of religiosity, but this is the time period in which it's most likely to happen. And two, this is not unique to any one group. You see this among groups across different races and ethnicities, across different religious denominations, including very strict religions like, a, like Mormonism. This has been documented that if there's a time for kind of a move away from religion, it's at this point in your life. That said, not everyone remains on the outskirts of religion forever. 
And when people uh, enter adulthood, and this is the scholars kind of define adulthood in different, different ways, we're gonna think about it as like getting married and having kids, that's when people sort of make a decision about whether to kind of become more religious or not. They all of a sudden now have to make an, a decision about what kind of religious upbringing do I want to have for my family and what do I want to impart on my children. It's not a time when everyone returns to religion, right? You might actively make the choice not to, but it's often a time where folks are thinking about that. And I should say, I've been, I was saying this at lunch too, I now have a six-year-old and it's weird that after all of this research is done, now I'm, I'm living this world of like, okay, so how am I raising my child in, with faith or without faith, right? But I'm making that, ch that conscious choice right now. After you make that choice, a lot of times the sociologists note, yeah, religion ID, how religious you are, actually is then pretty stable. Things can change, like divorce, a death in the family. These are things that naturally do push people out or bring people into the religious sphere. But now we're sort of much more in um, the assumption, we're back, we're back to this assumption that, that political scientists often make that once we reach that point, religious identification is generally more stable. Although I think you could argue that in the Trump world, maybe that's not all completely the case, but we can talk about that in Q&A. Okay, so with like an entire sociology of religion literature under our belts in like three minutes, we're gonna switch to something that at least the political scientists in the room should be more familiar with, which is the partisan, uh, how we form our partisan identities. And how we form our partisan identities, well, there's a couple theories about it, but the one that I am most attracted to as far as like having the most empirical evidence is this idea of the impressionable years hypothesis, which is that when we're in a childhood, our party ID, our party identification, our political views, pretty unstable, very changing. But then our, our adolescence, in adolescence, our party identification starts to crystallize. And this can come from influences from your parents, it can be from your peers, it can be from really big events, um, you know, kind of wars, economic collapses, but it can also be from just regularly occurring events like uh, elections, right, and experiencing who's, who's, lead, who's winning and, and who's seen as winners, political winners and losers. But importantly, scholars have noted that once that party identification crystallizes, it's largely stable over your adult life, that there's not a ton of changing. And not only is this party identification stable and strong and predictive of your vote choice, but it's also become an identity in its own right, right? That we're on this we team, we want to support our own team, we view the world through our political tinted glasses, right? So this, this, um, this theory, when we put these together, shows kind of a, dis I don't want to use discontinuity because that sounds like it's a methodological term, but there's, a, there's kind of a disjuncture here that people are developing their party identifications when their religious identifications just happen to be in flux. It's not as important to them. Religion is on the back burner. But now they're making a decision right here about whether or not to return to religion, how religious to be, but their party identification is stable. Now importantly, sociologists and, and folks have looked at this decision, and I don't wanna make the case that party and politics is the only thing that matters in making that decision. It's not, but I'm a political scientist, so it's the one we're gonna focus on, that we're gonna, I'm gonna show you that politics is one of these things that's having an effect, right? And part of that decision is because religion is still changeable at this point. And I'm actually thinking about this a lot of the times is about being married and having children. Marriage is sort of secondary, but having children at home. Because this is that time where you're making decisions for yourself and your family at the same time. How do I want my children to be raised? Do I want them going to Sunday school? Do I want them going to church? And that's going to be obviously related to your own levels of religiosity. Conversely, when your children are grown, We've already made these decisions and we expect our religious identification to be more stable. We would expect your party influence to be less strong, that your political identity shouldn't be driving religious change at a time when your religious identification is stable. So these are these theoretical, this is kind of the, the basis of the empirical sections of the book, which is that we have different predictions for different types of people and that some people should be more, um, their religious identity should be more malleable than others. And when your religious identity is more malleable, we're more likely to see politics exert an influence. So 
The empirical strategy, so how I'm actually testing this throughout the book, is in particular, I'm really interested in this close relationship between religion and politics, and in this case, particularly the Republican Party and kind of religious conservatives, and if that's affecting partisans' religiosities. And the reason why I look at that is because that is the argument about the reverse, right? The argument of why religious people became Republicans and secular and non-religious people became Democrats was because of this kind of Q-driven story that religious elites and political elites that are that have come together they're basically teaching average folks about how to sort and I'm saying sure they've learned how to sort but they're not just sorting into the parties based on their religious views they're sorting into their into religion based on their political views and in particular, we're testing the socialization theory that I can always look at a full sample and say, look, politics affects religion, except based on the life cycle theory that I just presented, we don't actually expect everyone to be affected in the same way. So part of the empirical strategy is to look at different people at different points in their life. And then finally, there's some scope conditions, for instance, being born outside the US and then, and then about non-white people. I'm gonna kind of just stick a pin in that and happy to talk about it if folks are interested uh, in the discussion. Okay, so we're gonna, great, talk about the first piece of empirical evidence. And this is to look at this beginning of the elite divergence. So I started by, t by showing this giant picture of Ronald Reagan and say things really started to change with him running for office in 1979. That's not quite, quite true. It really started earlier in the early part of the 70s. So this is just meant to be a bit of a visual cacophony. You don't need to know everything that's on this board. But basically it started, so in 1972, we have McGovern, lost Democratic nominee, supported liberal policies on gender, abortion, marijuana. Um, he, this, the 1972 election was the first time that the Democratic Party had in their platform about, you know, kind of valuing different lifestyles, the rights of women, alternative lifestyles. It's the first time that secularists and kind of, um, like, kind of religiously Seculars and kind of these uh, these uh, secular activists had like kind of a real stake in making the Democratic platform. So this kind of move between the Democrats and the Republicans, and this is this is this is work by some great scholars in Notre Dame, are actually showing that it was sort of people on the left kind of moved left first on these like social, cultural, religious issues, right? We then have. The Moral Majority being founded in 1978. There were other religious political coalitions that existed, but nothing on the scale of Jerry Falwell's Moral Majority, advocating for conservative religious policies, uh, holding rallies for someone like um, Ronald Reagan, the, the presidential nominee for the Republican Party. Um, and so you can see that the, that the parties are sort of separating. They also separate on abortion, right? So 1973, you have Democrats and Republicans both having pro-choice and pro-life people in their camps. That diverges over time that by, by definitely by 1984, but by 1980, you have Republicans being the pro wanting a constitutional amendment banning abortion, and on, on the Democratic side, supporting Roe v. Wade. Uh, we also have the ERA. This is where things got stopped getting ratified. We have prayer in school being something that Reagan campaigned on. So there's just all this change happening at the elite level that for the first time, people were able to use the cues at the elite level and say, oh, maybe if I'm really religious and I care about these things, maybe I should be a Republican. And that's where scholars who have looked at the relationship between religion and politics, looking at how religion affects politics, this is the first place that they look for evidence. So I think we should look for this, this should be the first place I look for evidence to show that politics is affecting religion as well. So. I, to do that, use a very unique set of data um, that is that many of you in the room might be familiar with, the Youth Parent Socialization Panel, which interviews a um, sample, a national sample of high school seniors and their parents in 1965. So this, all the high school seniors are 17 or 18 years old, and then obviously their parents are varying ages. Those people then leave home and are re-interviewed when they're 25 in 1973. And then again in 1982, and then I also have data in the book that goes on to 1987, or sorry, 1997. So the question is, how does partisanship correlate with changes in religiosity over the life cycle? Because you can see 
Let's see if my clickers are, let's ignore that for the moment. You can see between 1965 and 1973, the political landscape doesn't change much, but this is precisely the time when people move away from home. So we can test kind of one part of the theory. But also we see here, these are folks getting married and having kids and having school-aged kids in this window, precisely at the time that the religious landscape is shifting. So if we were to expect politics to exert an influence on religious decision-making, the folks in this data set these high school seniors in 1965 should actually be the first place we should find evidence of it. Like we shouldn't really see it with folks previously. And then additionally, what's nice about having the parent data is we can actually measure the parents' religiosities as a way of saying, okay, we know what kind of home these people are coming from, okay? So we're gonna focus on the, the, you're just gonna, I'm happy to talk about the technical stuff if people want, but we're gonna focus on some raw, some nice raw data here. So here we have my handy dandy theory at the bottom here. First we're looking at 1965 to 1973, so that's when these youth are here. And you can see this is the percent attending church almost weekly. And you basically see it plummets, right? And this is this is not anything super new or novel. This is, com but it's nice that it can it comports with the uh, existing sociology literature, which is basically once you take away parents making kids go to church, they kind of stop going to church, right? But what I really care about here, this is partisanship in 1965, is what you see here is the red is Republicans in 1965, the blue is Democrats, and you see that they're just everyone's falling away. There's no partisan difference in falling away from religion between 1965 and 1973. And if you include controls, you can just this is showing the change and it's basically a nice flat line at zero, right? Which is what you would expect with something like this. All right, so we see all this movement away from religion between 1965 and 1973. But what we really care about is what's happening between 1973 and 1982. This is when the political landscape changed and this is when um, these folks were making decisions about whether or not they were returning to religion. And so again, on the left-hand side, this is raw, and we see two things. One, we see everybody is increasing slightly. The Democrats and Republicans, their levels of church attendance are going up. We see that in 1973, these two groups are identical. They don't look any different as far as 1973 Democrats and 1973 Republicans, how often they went to church in 1973. But that the number, the, it increased dramatically, or it increased lot more for Republicans and Democrats. So this is a way of saying Republicans return to the religious fold between 73 and 82 at a higher rate than Democrats. And this is consistent with what the theory would predict. Um, another way we could think about it, though, is I could say, well, Michelle, maybe religion is also affecting politics at this time as well, right? So maybe politics is affecting religion. I believed your previous slide, but maybe it's happening in both directions. And how can you explain that? Because their religious identity is not is supposed to be um, is is not supposed to be very strong. And the answer is there isn't really evidence of that. So this is looking at your religious. I participation, like how much you participated between 1973 and 1980, or in 1973, and predicting whether it changed party ID between 73 and 82. So basically, did more religious people from 1973, are they more likely to become Republican? And the answer is no. The answer is we have this flat line at zero, that there isn't actually a change, that your religiosity didn't produce any noticeable changes in your party identification. But I also just told you that party identification is very hard to change, right? So maybe that's part of it. So here on the on the right, we just have this is Republican vote choice, so changing who you said you voted for, because we do know that people say that they're Republican but might vote for the Democrat and vice versa, um, especially in this time period. And we once again find no I find no relationship. So this is this is even though I find that politics is, partisanship is affecting change in church attendance, I'm not finding evidence that church attendance is having any effect in politics among this generation. And then finally, what's also nice is we can look at the parents, right? Because the parent generation, I told you that their religious identity should theoretically be stable. But maybe this seismic shift in the political landscape and this relationship between religion and politics becoming super salient, maybe it was affecting the parents as well. And I find that that really isn't the case. So this is, we can just focus on the raw here. These are Democrats. These are Democratic parents and Republican parents. And you see that there's like a little bit of movement, but it doesn't look like the previous slide, that we don't see Democrats and Republicans kind of moving in opposite directions in this time period, right? So 
There's a lot of alternative explanations, right? I love observational data. They're fun to play with. It's fun to have that external validity. It leaves a lot open, right? And so I'm happy to talk about any of the stuff, right? Especially we're talking about the Vietnam War. We have Southern realignment going on. There's a lot of stuff that I'm gonna happy to talk about if folks want. Um, but I think one way to just answer this is to look at it in another setting, right? And let's, and I think I have time. So the second way we can look at it is do something very similar, and I'll go through this more quickly. When another time that the relationship between religion and politics gets sa becomes salient, and that's in 2003, 2004, and it deals with gay marriage. So for those of us who can't remember what happened last week, you probably don't remember what happened in 2003, 2004, but in November 2003, gay marriage became a super salient political issue. It started when the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled same-sex marriage to be legal. These are the plaintiffs, Julie and Hillary Good, good ridge, good ridge, good right. Uh, and that's, um, they got married, right? So it became a very salient issue. Um, just two months later, this is much younger governor, Gavin Newsom, he was then San Francisco mayor, uh, Gavin Newsom. He ordered San Francisco city officials to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples, despite it being in violation of California um, family code. That's him marrying actually Phil Dulles, uh, Phil, Phyllis and Del Lyons, they were very prominent, I think they've now since passed away, prominent lesbian activists. In response to this, George uh, Bush, then president, gave a nationally televised address um, encouraging a uh, federal marriage amendment, so a change to the Constitution, making, uh, making uh, marriage between a man and a woman. That gained some traction, stalled, it was a democratically controlled Senate, but it made the gay marriage very salient throughout the summer, when then, November 2004, in addition to it being a presidential election year, 11 states had gay marriage initiatives on the ballot, and by initiatives I mean gay marriage laws that would make gay marriage being between a man and a woman. All 11 of them passed, they're here in orange. They went alongside, the, there were only five states that had those statutes already on the books, and so it went from five up to 16. So that brings us to November 2024. So from November 2023 to November 2024, gay marriage and this relationship between um, religious conservatives taking this conservative political position and the Republican Party taking this conservative religious position was, was very salient for this entire time. And so an example of this, I should make it clear, this is not me, this comes from... Um, from Louis Bolche, who's a great a great scholar at, at CUNY Baruch. Um, he, this, is a, this is a content analysis looking at the number of stories in the New York Times and the Washington Post depicting the two parties as being different on these kind of like religious and secular grounds. And you can basically see the number of articles is like zero, and then there's an uptick in 2003, and then there's this huge spike in 2004. So this is just some, a little bit, it's, I wouldn't call it anecdotal, it's data, but kind of suggesting that this was a really salient issue and there was a lot of attention generally paid to the growing division between Democrats and Republicans on these social, cultural, religious issues. So then the question is, if this is what's happening at the elite level, what's happening in individual decision making? And so for that, um, I turn to the American National Election Study, which asks questions in 2000, 2002, 2004. Um, and just like the, the previous panel, this is panel data set, so it's the same individuals asked. Um, a hiccup with this politics affecting religion argument is that finding existing data, which is why I collected a lot of my own data, is hard to come by because if we think that it is sta a stable trait, we only measure it once. Right? If you're in a panel data, we don't ask your age multiple times because we don't think that's changing. We think you got it right. We think you understood the question. Right? And so finding surveys, so in this case, only church attendance was asked, even though you could imagine lots of religious measures changing, but it's not always easy to get, if, if these are thought as just kind of unchanging demographic variables, they're not being asked multiple times. So. We're using church attendance, which ranges from zero to one in my case. And so I'm gonna just, I wanna, I, I really like to look at data without any controls, but I'm happy to talk about 
the models if you want. This is the full sample. So basically, what do we see here? We see one, we see a God gap. We see this religiosity gap in which Republicans are going to church more so than Democrats. This gap exists in 2000, it exists in 2002. There's no change here. And then there's a little bit of a divergence between 2002 and 2004. This is looking at the full sample. But again, theoretically, we don't, I mean, we care about the full sample, but we don't really care about the full sample because we have different theoretical expectations based on where people are in their life. So for, for I'm going to look at grown children, sorry, people with grown children. These are the people for whom we expect religious identities to be stable. And this is what we see. So we see a lot of flatness. But for these folks down here, we see a huge shift. And we see it's a much larger shift in, in the drop in Democrats and the increase in Republicans, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. But what I want to take away from this figure as well is that we're not just looking at 2002 to 2004. We're actually seeing that between 2000 and 2002, there's, there's stability, right? It's not that this gap is always emerging, but in response to this information becoming very clear to, to voters and to citizens, we start to see people update. And we see a specific set of people updating, and those are the people for whom their religious identities are not yet stable. So I'll spend just like a minute talking about the alternative explanations, which is that, uh, well, I'm, not, I'll, I'm happy to talk about aging versus life cycle, but I think what I like about this AHINES data, what I think is kind of interesting about it, is the, the older people in this data were the younger people, not exactly the same people, but the cohort was the children in the previous cohort. So, so it's not just the fact that maybe that one cohort that I looked at previously, maybe that one cohort was super weird and that they're always, they have just very malleable religious identifications and it's gonna, tr it's gonna go with them their whole life because now those guys are these guys and they're actually being quite, they're quite stable, right? And so, and so it's a new generation that is, that is making the changes and the people who were previously found to change were then had stabilized and flattened out. Um, and then uh, I, I also look at that this is about religious involvement, not involvement in general. So this is unique to religious part participation, not just like joining sports clubs and other forms of secular participation. And then it also, just like there was the Vietnam War, we're also in the Iraq War here. So like that's, that's something to consider. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up. So what I hope I convince you guys of today, um, and that I hope, I, I hope so, is that there's a particular window in an individual's life when they're susceptible to outside influences. I didn't talk about this part, but susceptible to outside influences, that can be a lot of different things, but in, in this case, politics, is that they're, they're receptive to political cues and that in particular, this close relationship between the Republican Party and religious conservatism is having an unintended consequence in affecting people's religious decision-making at a crucial point in their life. And importantly, that once they've made that decision, that carries through for years to come. Okay, so I just wanna wrap up with three concluding thoughts, which is, it doesn't seem like this phenomenon is going away for, for a lot of reasons, but I'll focus on one, which is this, I spent a long time making these bars even, but we don't actually spend an even amount of time in each of these bars, right? In the scheme of things, we are a child for a very short period of our life. But these windows, this window is getting longer and bigger, right? Because people are more likely to get go on to higher education. We are continuing to delay getting married. We are continuing to delay when we have our first child, right? So the longer you're on the outskirts of religion, the more time you have for these other identities and values and beliefs to really solidify and then have an influence once you reach here. It doesn't mean you don't necessarily ever get here, but the longer we're outside the, the kind of so the, the religious sphere and the longer we're, we're sort of, it's not our priority because we have other things going on, namely increasingly getting more education and delaying, delaying that kind of life cycle transition into adulthood, the more influence we might expect politics to have. The second, oh, you can't really see, which religious community? So something my book does not talk about. So this is, I, there's a church by my house that has this exact image, but I didn't, I for, for whatever reason, didn't have my phone with me, which I feel like never happens, to take a picture. But this is, so this is from the internet. But this is just like a little thought experiment, which I think if, if anyone's like doubting whether politics can affect religion, 
what types of people do we think choose to walk in these doors and go to this church? Yeah, or at the very least, people who support the BLM movement and support LGBT rights, right? Ignoring like what your actual political affiliation is. That if anyone's concerned about religion's influence on politics, think about the self-selection that goes into the types of people who go, who choose to go to different churches. And obviously plenty of churches don't wave any any banners, but I actually think you can make the argument that not waving certain banners actually is a signal now as well, right? So there's two things that, so one is, is what my book doesn't talk about is I talk about religiosity. So Democrats being less religious than Republicans and Republicans going back into church. It speaks nothing of the fact that you can also self-select into which church you want, right? And so that Democrats can easily find a religious home if they want to, right? And that's its own um, set of politically induced religious sorting. It doesn't mean that Democrats have to be not religious. It means that they find a religious and spiritual home that comports with their pre-existing political and social views. And this is like an example of the fact of if we thought, I don't think that the pastor who works at this church probably has, it might, he might, he or she might be able to mobilize people to act on a, on a political issue. But I don't think this person's changing anyone's minds, right? Because the people who decided to come here already believe the things that, that this pastor is going to be talking about, right? Um, and so this self-selection into certain religious congregations is a whole other kind of politics affecting religious decision-making that nonetheless creates these sort of echo chambers of we're with the same type of person um, politically, even when we're in, a, in an apolitical setting like, like church. And then finally, new issues and elites can change and, and, and can, can change the game. I think in some ways, Donald Trump's rise and sustained prominence among, um, and, and kind of excitement among, among white evangelicals and, and religious Christians, white Christians in particular, I think in some respects is just an extension of what's already in existence, that it's not changing the game. But I think certain aspects of him have sort of changed how we start to think about this relationship between religious religion and politics and the hoops that people are willing to jump through and sort of mental gymnastics uh, that people are willing to make in order to keep their religious and political identities in alignment. Um, so in some respects, Trump is changing the game. I also think Trump has, has not fully changed the game as much as we might have expected. But I do think it's important to think about as the religious political landscape changes, our expectations about where different types of people move, that can change. But the key issue is if you start to have a different set of expectations about who should be a liberal or who should be religious or who should go to what kinds of churches, the first place you would want to look is at a certain subset of people to see how they're making their religious decision making. Like they're going to be the, the bellwether of what kind of changes are going to come. And so with that, I will stop. Great. Can I bring this? To sure. Was it in? Do you have a preference of seats? No, not at all. Okay. Thank you very much for a great talk. So I'd like to begin with uh, one of your findings. And, and by the way, for the grad students in the audience and undergrads who hope to write a book, this is really fantastic. Uh, it's one of those books that you wish you would have wrote and also one of the books where you're like, oh, what about this? And then five pages later, there's the answer. You're like, oh, but what about that? And then 10 pages later, there it is. So really a, an excellent piece of uh, social science. So when we were talking before uh, your presentation, we, we mentioned, you know, we're, we're both raising two boys and I can't help but think of the stark finding of it's not just Republicans, it's Republicans and Democrats with kids, mm -hmm. right? Who, where the variation is, where the change is in your story. So I couldn't help but think what's going on in the homes, right? Like, is this in part a story about parenting styles, right? And so I, I want to throw a couple speculations your way and to get at, you know, what might be, so we have this observational finding yeah. that it's, it's not everyone. It's really these, you know, people at this stage who have children, right, who are driving this change. So one, it could be that, okay, if you are a parent 
who's a Democrat versus a parent who's a Republican, you have probably different worldviews. Mm -hmm. And those different worldviews are then being mapped on to parenting decisions, right? So I, I would think about, I, I recently saw a talk by Mark Hetherington who's talking about you know challenging what we think ideology is. And the ideology is a worldview and not ideas about the size and scope of government. So if conservative worldview is more authoritarian, more traditionalistic, then the idea is, well, if I believe more in authority and I value tradition more, then I am going to make the decision to have my kids in the religious institutions of my upbringing as a way to kind of pass down the traditions of, of my family and my culture, where if you are a democratic parent, your worldview is you know more open to change, uh, more comfortable with um, you know different populations and different ideas, and you're like, well, you know, that's the way it was when I was growing up, but I want, you know, my kids to find their own way, or we're going to, we're going to do something different. So is it that, or is it the possibility that this is something that's social going on? And you mentioned this a little bit in your book. So I'll just say, I have a family friend who is secular but lives in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> and all of her social activities are in the church, right? So she's, she's atheist, she's secular, but if you live in Birmingham, Alabama, like this is your social life, right? So she, and she's in a religious book club. She has, you know, she's involved in all these, she's involved in her church every Sunday, but she's atheist. And, but this is what you do in Birmingham, Alabama. As, so, I, you know, you, you accounted for people living in the South, but I'm wondering if there's like a regional story where if you are a Republican with kids, you live in an area where this is what people do socially. So so those are kind of two speculative tracks about what's going on with these parent with kids. Sure. Feel free to take it. Yeah. You know. No, these are yeah. super great questions. So I think I think empirically, I think at least with the observational. So I think that you're right, uh, and I think I think part of it is then about the stories about maybe it is about these worldviews about and how you raise your kids, but then the, the political elites, we didn't used to see that, right? So if it was if if Democrats in the '70s were just like we are just open to new experiences and that's our thing, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't have been going to church in the 70s anyway, mm -hmm. right? But they were, they, 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 that there were, were there were differences between Democrats and Republicans until the elites at least separated and show them those cues. So it could be that part of what is going on is it's because I, I have read the really excellent work about parenting, you know, par like uh, liberal and conservative kind of parenting mentalities. But it, if that's the case, then it's still the elites queuing it up for the folks so that then they just have to like, you know, take a swing at it, that they, they can make that decision um, and to be, to be in alignment. So I think that that's possible. I mean, I do think that some of what's good about, so like, for instance, the, 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 the data, the data that goes across their whole lives, we actually know something about their religious upbringings. Like we can, we can kind of account for that. And then for, you know, the short term panels, it's like, well, this is actually something that's happening in response to something else, right? That, they, that these people's worldviews didn't necessarily change dramatically in a two year period. What happened is that they, it was made salient and they said, oh, right, this goes with this. And now I'm updating. But I do think that it has to do a, a bit. I mean, again, all, all research is me search, but having a six year and making these own decisions, it, a lot of it is about like, well, what are my values? And I don't want to send my kids somewhere and then have that kid come home and say something and say, oh, well, we don't really believe that part or we don't, we don't really think like that, right? You want those things to be in concert. And, and, and so it is part of your, it is definitely part of your parenting worldview. The question is, I guess you didn't also say, is my parenting, I was, I had my political affiliations before I became a parent. So you could also make the argument of my parenting worldview might also be a function of my political outlook, not, uh -huh. not the other way around. So that it's, uh -huh. it might just not be, so the story might be partisanship, parenting worldview than religious decision-making, but not so much that the religious, not that the, um, not so much that your uh, parenting worldview is what's like predicting your partisan outlook because I, I had my political view, views long before I became a parent. But if you told me that my parenting outlook is very much 
a consequence of my political view, I'd believe that. And then I, I think, so I was smiling when you're talking about Birmingham, Alabama, because I, I spent an entire summer in Alabama, and I highly encourage grad students to go, uh, like American politics grad students, to go do field work. I'm a big believer in that. So um, I, did, I did a summer in Alabama talking, essentially being like, what are we missing about white evangelicals, and how are we measuring this incorrectly? And I, that, I got that sense as well, and that was something that came out, that was after the book. But meeting folks who are like, I'm not religious, but of course I'm part of this institution because it's a social side of things. Um, and I think that, I think empirically, those people just end up on the off diagonal, right? Like, or they, there are just going to be Democrats. There are Democrats who are religious, and that sounds like your friend, possibly, or like maybe she's not a Democrat, but she's a non-religious person, part of this community, and maybe that doesn't fit, um, and that there are these kind of social ties that that overshadow. And I don't I don't have a great answer because I came to that realization also, but after the fact. Yeah. Um, great. So I want to pull on something that you said in that answer. It really jumped out at me. So yeah, you said that you don't want to have the conversation with your kid when they come home, like saying, this isn't what we believe, right? Countering, you don't want to live in a place where you are countering the message of the institutions you are sending your children to. So again, in thinking about that divergence with Republican parents and Democratic parents, there seems to be a perception, potentially based in reality, in conservative circles of the liberalization of society, of schools, of businesses, of culture, of, you know, Hollywood. So is partly what we're seeing, thinking about that conversation, I don't want to counter messages that we don't believe in, that if you are in an area where you're like, listen, my kid's bringing home liberal crap from schools and from watching television and from even going to baseball games where they might have, you know, like, let's say they, someone um, is admits to like an LGBTQ night at a baseball park. Might that decision be made to to reengage with religion if you believe that society is is this part of the story that if, if you see society is moving in another direction in the institutions of society, then you are going to you know have your children be part of an institution where you can say these are the messages that are in our house and also now in the church or the synagogue. So I think that's right. I also think that that's what we saw in the from from 1920 to 1980s in in kind of evangelical white evangelical America, which is to say that you know the Scopes Monkey Trial is this pivotal moment in in kind of American religious history, which is that that evangelicals won the they won the the lawsuit, but they they were made to look um, really dumb in the media, and they were they were laughed at and, and scorned. And so what do they do? They they retreated into their own communities, but they didn't just retreat. They built publishing empires and they built media empires. And so you could you could read Christian published books and you can see Christian published movies and you can listen to Christian produced music. And so that was that was what that world looked like, which was that we don't want to be part of this dirty secular society that, by the way, also doesn't think very highly of us. We're going to create our own community, but build the infrastructure to really sustain it. And then it was, you know, late 70s, 80s that that, that changed and has become more um, the, the, the decision to re-engage in, in, the, in the social life, in the political life of the United States. And that gets us to where we're at now, which is this question of, right, school boards, like all these things that no one, no one ever cared about school boards, right? But now it's, they're super important, right? And, and people who have been studying it for decades are like, see, I told you so. Um, but this question of, so you could easily imagine a world in which everything that's going on with school and critical race theory and woke this and inclusivity that, that the answer could have been, we're going to do what we did when integration was being forced upon us and just go back into our, you know, conservative Christian schooling. But now the difference is that it's actually people engaging and trying to make change at the kind of policy level. But consequently, also, I think that that's, you're, you're, you're both trying to, the, some of these folks, I think, are trying, they're, they're certainly going to 
it's going to push them into the religious in involvement or the religious communities that, that comport with their views. But now they're also trying to reshape some of our social institutions that are public to, to better reflect their their political and religious views, which is different than mid 20th century, where the answer was, we're gonna just take a step back and we'll, we'll essentially privatize it. We'll do our own thing. We don't need to worry about the bad things on TV because you're, we're gonna be watching our own television shows that are produced. And so I think we're seeing some of that play out from the mid 20th century today. The difference is, rather than retreating, it's much more of this direct engagement of, of trying to change the institutions um, that are that that have been dramatically changing, um, you know, for better or for worse, depending on your viewpoint, but changing dramatically in a relatively short period of time from a how long it takes to change societal minds about things, um, right? The like LGBT example is like the include the level of inclusivity, like the. the Anyone who studies public opinion, right, we know that the, the change in support for same-sex marriage and kind of the sustained support, like, that stands counter to every article ever written on stability of macro-level attitudes and individual-level change and all of that stuff that, like, it, this flies in the face of, you know, the societal change that there's just, like, huge shift in the pro-tolerance direction on all things LGBT in such a short period of time is, is from a, I'm saying this as, like, a scholar of public opinion, like quite astonishing, right? Like it's unlike any other kind of public opinion change that we've, we've ever seen. And that, that's a lot to certain people if that's not, if that's not your personal or religious worldview. But I think again, now it's it, this engaging outward instead of inward is, I think we're gonna see more of that, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. So I wanna turn now to focus on, I, I really like the way that you laid out your uh, theory on the kind of critical period of uh, young adulthood and the role of universities. So during this period, you know, you have more young people going to college. And one of the more recent trends that we've seen in American politics is what's called the diploma divide, where people with, a, with higher levels of education Education are voting consistently for the Democratic candidate, people with lower levels of education voting for the Republican candidate in a way that wasn't true in the 80s. And one of the explanations I've seen for the diploma divide is the idea that when students go to college, it's not that they're being brainwashed by liberal politics in the classroom, it's that across different classes and fields, they're being indoctrinated into the importance of the scientific method and science and evidence-based thinking. So when they leave college, they've really kind of gotten the message that, you know, to make an effective argument, you really kind of need evidence in, you know, it's important to kind of go through the certain method. Is that partly what we're what we're seeing here? If, if you match the kind of what might be going on as far as this message of the importance of the science, of importance of science and evidence and the diploma divide with the Republican Democratic parent yeah. divide. That's a great. That's a really great question. I I don't know if it is only in as much as I think that there's this common misconception, and that here we're not talking about religious and non-religious. We're talking about white evangelicals in particular, but white evangelicals on average are more religious. Than, than other forms of, of Protestantism and Catholicism, um, that white evangelicals used to be, on average, far have far lower rates of education than, say, their mainline counterparts or their Catholic counterparts, and that's not the case anymore. So it's it's not so much that these individuals are just it's it's all about education, and these people just don't have college education because it's it's not. I do think that maybe it it has to do with kind of degrees and what people, like not degrees, like, but degrees, like what their degree is in. I think that that might be, I think that that might be part of it. Um, and that might be some of what's happening with the return to religion or not, but, but a lot of the sociology of religion, and this has also been recent, um, more recent work that came out after the book, which is that the, the move away from religion is actually starker among people who don't go to college. 
Um, and you'd think that it wouldn't be. You'd think that it's about like, you go to college, you leave home, you're surrounded by all these liberal people, but there's also all these religious groups on campus, and if you want to get involved, they make a very welcoming home. It's and, But they, they actually talk about a lot of folks who go straight into the workforce, or maybe they get an associate's degree, and then they start working. They actually are, they're, they're, again, they're not necessarily rejecting religion, but they're, they're struggling, right? And that means they're often working on Sundays, or that they worked a, a lot during the week, and so they're just too tired on Sunday that actually it's, it's in some respects far easier to maintain um, a religious tie and a religious connection going to a, a high, an institute of higher learning than, than to, to skip that and, and to go straight into the workforce because there are different sort of pulls on your time and different, you know, different things that might be keeping you from being religiously involved. But I think, I think it's, I think it. I think it's easy to assume that that folks who go on to college are become less religious than their than their non college attending counterparts, and empirically that's not the case. Oh. But but then the question is, what happens later on? Maybe the people who then went to college, maybe they they declined at similar rates, but stuff that they learned in college is getting is affecting their, you know, both their politics and, you know, it's also different, right? The politics, there's all this other realignment that's going on that it used to be that labor was staunchly Democrats. You had a whole bunch of Democrats who weren't, you know, don't have college degrees, right? Or many of whom, and now that, as you say, this diploma divide is really stark. So I think it could be happening on the back end, but interestingly enough, I don't think it's what's driving kind of distancing from religion um, and that the, the undergrads at Syracuse may actually be slightly more religious than their friends from, if they had friends from high school who didn't go to college at all. Huh. I, I would say that the religion I've seen is college basketball for me. <laughs> um, Especially in the month of March and April. Yeah, or hanging out on Walnut Street. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to ask one more question and then turn it over to the audience, and I, I might interject too a little bit with the audience. So I, I want to think of, you know, you presented a lot of convincing evidence about how the political landscape, right? And as you mentioned, you're kind of challenging the conventional wisdom. And as someone who grew up with a framed picture of Jesus Christ and John F. Kennedy upstairs, I appreciated your uh, chapter eight on the 1960 election. So, I, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about how changes in religion might affect either people's engagement with religion or, you know, their political activity within religious institutions. So the, the Catholic Church recently, you know, hierarchical went from Pope Benedict, who, although German, was viewed by American Catholics as conservative, right, and appointed conservative cardinals and overall kind of conservative ethos of the church, to Pope Francis, who, again, although Argentine, viewed as, you know, more liberal and, you know, appointing more liberal cardinals. So when you have that type of change, so, you know, it's, it's, a change in the religious landscape, what might you expect mm. given your theory? Yeah, that's a really good question because I know also, right, this is about partisanship, mm -hmm. but they, I, I do, I, I have seen work that's specifically about Catholics and it's specifically about, you know, leaving the church because of abortion, birth control, and like, you know, women, not women can't be priests specifically, but like about like hierarchy and gender norms, right? And so that, that those are, they're social views, but they're, they're religious things that are pushing people out of the church. And then the question is, what happens when the messages from the church change? And so um, I've done some work on this with, with um, evangelicals and their attitudes about immigration, which is not the same thing because there's not this hierarchical pope structure. Um, but it does seem like added, people do generally respond to their... the. They can change their attitudes a little bit, but more importantly, it seems like what they stop doing is um, is is taking action against that thing. So, so does that make sense? So, this idea that maybe you're not gonna be if you know. So, Pope Francis is known for being like you know super progressive on things like immigration and caring for the poor, right? So, if you're if you're a devout Catholic, it wouldn't necessarily mean, and and maybe you're conservative and you and you support things like a wall, perhaps. Um, maybe maybe Fran Pope Francis's you know decrees and and commentary on the issue. It doesn't make them now. I'm going to go out and write to my congressman against the wall, but it's going to stop me from writing my support for the wall, if that makes sense. So it's, it's kind of encouraging the non-behavior, if that 
makes sense rather than like, you, it's hard to pivot. You're, I don't think a religious message, even if you think it's from on high, and this is actually something I think is also the case with, with members of LDS, right, churches, like there's also similar kind of pivots in beliefs and what, and it's all supposed to be, you know, from, um, from a higher order. It was like, you're just the intermediary, so to speak. Uh, and I do think that there's a lot to be said for, for this. Maybe you're not really updating your attitudes and you're certainly not going out and being active on that issue, but it might kind of quash your quell, quell, I combine quell and, and squash, it's quell your desire to actively try to promote that policy that the, that the church is arguing against. Great. Hey, thank you. All right. So at this point, we'll turn it over to you. So uh, Bethany will walk around with the microphone. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and you can introduce yourself. Um, and we'll take it from here. Hi. Interesting uh, discussion, and I'm not a student, uh, but I am troubled by the terms religious Americans or religiosity uh, because I don't really know what they mean, and I don't know how you use them in your research. Uh, there are many, many people who claim to be religious who don't behave re religiously, and uh, on the other side of the coin, there are many so-called non-religious people with uh, the exact same ethics of a traditional religious person. So how does that come into the way you do your yeah. research? So that's a really great question. And so, so I guess the first answer is I apologize because I did not make it clear. So in this case, I am focusing on sort of self-reported. So in the, in the data that I presented today, we're looking at self-reported church attendance as the measure. But in the book, I look at kind of strength of religious identification, self-reported relig self religiosity. And so these are all very squishy terms because it's at the end of the day, people are saying it about themselves. Um, but... I think that there's a lot of, well, I guess there's two, two answers to that, but which is first, subjective measures are usually somewhat uh, related to objective measures. So even if we think that church attendance, maybe you'd want to take this as this is how much people are actually going to church. And maybe that's not right because people are poor, they're not great at this. But if we take it as a subjective measure of we're using church attendance as a proxy that someone who thinks of themselves as religious or maybe thinks of themselves in an idealized world would be more religious. So it's, it's getting, it is getting in sort of their subjective head, even if in this case it's looking at an, it's supposed to be an objective question of how many times a, a year do you go to church or whatever the question is. Um, so, so I apologize. So in this case, religiosity is usually about religious engagement, about how much, how much you are going um, how frequently you're going to church, but I want to just jump ahead to your second point, because I do think that this disconnect is really, really important. And this is actually my ongoing work, which is this idea that there's, um, a whole bunch of people who don't believe the things they're supposed to believe. And we can think about this as evangelicals. We can think about this as, you know, all sorts of identities like pro-life or feminist, all these identities that you could imagine a world in which there's a prescribed set of beliefs. Like evangelicals are supposed to believe X. And you have a whole bunch of people who don't believe those things, but they are on the Christian or evangelical team that they call themselves an evangelical. They take pride in being an evangelical, that it matters a great deal to their sort of self-esteem. But then to your point, there's the other side as well, which are people who actually believe all the things they're supposed to believe, but they're like, nah, labels, schmables. Like it's just not that important part of who they are. And that's actually my ongoing, that's my, my new book project, which is exactly looking at this disconnect between the beliefs people hold but then the labels that they attach to themselves. And you could do that with, with Christianity, you can do that with secularism, but you could also do that with, you know, I'm sure we've all been in a conversation where someone says, I'm not a feminist, but, right? With this idea being, I believe in gender equality, I believe in all the things that feminism espouses, but I don't actually, I'm not on that feminist team, right? And but, but being on that team, we know from political science research is really important. And so part of what the new book, which started from in interviewing evangelicals in Alabama, what started as, as, as a story about Christians is now this big story about identities in general, so I'm digressing. But it is this distinction between the beliefs you hold 
and the identities you have and what you call yourself. And sometimes those things go together, but sometimes as you rightly pointed out, they don't. And they can not go together in both ways. You can not believe the things, but hold the identity and be like, yeah, I'm on this team. I care a lot about it. Or it could be the reverse, which is like, I don't care what these other people are doing, but these are my beliefs that I'm acting in a way that would suggest I'm on the team, even if I don't really care about being on the team. So. Oh, and then there's there's someone back there too. Hi, uh, my name's Sarah again. It's good to see you. Um, and this is a little bit of a two finger off of Chris's question, kind of like for future thinking. And so I know I'm asking you to extrapolate, which is a little unfair, and I'm really yeah, sorry. Go for it. Um, um, but you had a picture up of a sign from United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. um, and it, it sparked for me that the United Methodist Church is currently undergoing, you know, a schism about whether or not gay people should be ordained within the church or welcomed actively. Um, and then Chris's discussion of like the Catholic Church, where like the American Catholic Bishops Conference had this really strong stance about Joe Biden being able to take the Eucharist, whereas obviously Pope Francis was like, no, 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 that's, let's not do that. Um, and so I think we're potentially in a moment where like our religious institutions are remaking themselves mm -hmm. according to these lines. And so like, I guess, based on your work, do you think that this is as a result of the choices that people are making where like their partisan identity is kind of guiding then religious affiliation and the institutions are catching up with that? Or is there something else potentially going on here? So I think it's both. I mean, I think that I think that a big, and we talked about this at lunch, but I'll like tell everyone else, right? A big part of like what people who study American religious history as a field, it's about religion changing, and it's about religion changing oftentimes in response to the social and political milieu that they find themselves in. And so, in the case of today, we have we had do you have same sex marriage? Do you ordain women? Now it's do you ordain people who are LGBT? But 200 years ago was the split with the Baptists and do we are we okay with human enslavement or not right like that was the that was the social political issue of the day and now it's changed that that religious institutions have always been making and remaking itself it has always been interpreting and reinterpreting the text in in order to and it might not be explicitly in response to the political environment but oftentimes it is even if they don't call it that I, I will say so so one I think is that it's always been happening so we're we're seeing it today, but I think as someone who loves to read history, but history is not, you know, surprisingly, not surprisingly, not front and center in journalistic accounts of religion and politics. When you open up and read a newspaper article about religion and politics today, it's easy to read something and say, the relationship between religion and politics today is has always been this way and will always be this way. And in fact, it's not. And, and so I think that part of it is that these religious institutions are always remaking themselves, even though no one likes to say that because that's a way of saying religion changes and so it's hard to say we can't update on this point and we're going to fight on it because even though religion's always been changing. That said, I do think that religion is also very much responding to social pressure. So one of the conversations I had in Alabama was with a pastor who's no longer in Alabama because he, despite not, I think his parishioners call, would consider him very liberal. I don't think many in an academic institution would call him liberal, right? So, but he was preaching Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? And so it was like literally the words of Jesus Christ on a Sunday morning in a Baptist church. And he got emails and feedback from the board and from members that so many people were disgruntled because they didn't want to hear that liberal propaganda in church, right? So, but but because of that, I mean, in his case, he ended up, and he, he said, he's like, I'm very careful about what I preach about. And I talked to a lot of pastors about, you know, their views on immigration. I was, I was in Alabama during the family separation policy that summer of 2018. Um, and like their views on this and very, because they all know explicitly what the Bible says about these things, right? But also recognizing what their members would tolerate and be okay with and being very mindful about how they, if they talked about it, how they talked about it. So I think you also see religious institutions 
changing in real time based on decisions that folks are making because at the end of the day, a, can a church can't survive if people are leaving. And so this is to your point. And so people are, you know, either flying flags that say, you know, BLM and, and have rainbow flags that says, you know what, I know you have conceptions about what religion is like, but you can come here even if you think these things because we think them too. Or you're someone who actually censors themselves on things that they don't say, right? Because, and, and making sure that they don't say something that is, is seen as too overtly political, which in this case, most of the New Testament is about like welcoming strangers and feeding the poor, right? And so things that are sort of, uh, don't necessarily jive with like kind of the present day Republican political view and folks being very aware of that and making decisions based on that. So I think it's both like macro, mezzo, but also just individual pastor decision making for sure. Um, hi, I'm Deji, Nikon student. Um, my question is basically, you mentioned before that public opinion have, on issues such as like LGBTQ rights have changed pretty fast in the past. So do you think there could be an equal and opposite reaction from the right in leaning back into re religiosity on issues such as LGBTQ, essentially to cover back some of the ground they may have ceded to like the left? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I think so. I mean, I think, right, interestingly, there's huge generational differences on LGBT issues, even within religious kind of re white religion and white, white kind of conservative Christianity, that it's the, that young, young white Christians are still but they're much, much more supportive of, say, gay marriage than than older um, than older white Christians. So there's both kind of a generational divide. But I do think part of it is um, this is this is a, not a normative viewpoint. This is just my like empirical sense of like a lot changed in a very short amount of time. And I, and I think that there are some people who make the argument that the speed with which we as a country went from being like, like, so right, my undergrads are always like amazed, like shocked when I say that like Howard Dean was like so like crazily progressive and liberal that he supported civil unions, right, when he ran for president, right? And like that was, like, the, the, the Democratic Party wasn't always the party of like, of course we support gay marriage. Like, no, right? And Obama started saying it after his second reelection, right? Like, or after he was reelected, right, in his second term. And so that this shift among Democratic elites um, and average Democratic voters was like, nothing, no, nothing has ever moved that quickly. And so there has been um, arguments that have been made that is basically like, Maybe if this arc toward inclusivity on the LGBT issues, which were which are still being fought, right? We're not we're not there. The society isn't there yet. But if that had taken decades instead of years, or it was a much I mean it did take decades, but like this short arc took took decades. Maybe maybe conservative Christians would have gotten on board more quickly. But the fact that it did just sort of fly in the face of everything we've ever thought about kind of changing public opinion attitudes and like elite level shifts and kind of that sort of stuff. It did, there is an argument that's like, it left folks like befuddled almost, where it was just like, whoa, this was a lot of change really fast. We don't know how to handle it, right? And so, and that's, and some of the digging in and trying to reverse is actually a function of the speed with which it happened. I don't know if I 100% believe that, but that's, that is what it, people are, are saying. And I think it is about, there is something to be said for the, the, incredible amount of speed with which we went from like not being very tolerant or inclusive to L of LGBT people, even among people who, you know, were Democrats or liberal to like very, very, very inclusive. There's just, like very few examples of this in kind of American history and public opinion that shows such a steep shift in such a short period of time. So. I think there's one. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a student and I'm also not a parent, but I'm interested in, in what you pointed out about becoming a parent playing a role in solidifying and, and really nailing down religious views and affiliations. Uh, and while the child is growing up around that parent, if 
sort of the, the flip can happen where while that child is in flux, if that can kind of boomerang back around and maybe make the parents view things a little bit differently. So as an example, in a, a conservative uh, Christian household, if the child uh, is LGBT, uh, if there's any data to sort of look oh. at, is that more likely to put a wedge between the parents and religion or the parents and the child? And if there's anything to support mm -hmm. that maybe there's instances more common that would make a parent uh, assess where they stand. It's and, a great and if question. they do, um, is this maybe where the argument comes from that it's not a choice uh, or, or that it is a choice and not how the child just is and it's it's a way to kind of put it on the outside like mm -hmm. as we talked about with the the colleges the idea of yeah. indoctrination that's a great question and i that would be such tricky data to get so i don't have it i don't have a good answer i love the idea of like thinking that through because anecdotally you've heard both right you've heard parents who don't talk to their children because they're you know gender nonconforming or they're gay or whatever but you also do hear these stories of i once i had a child you know like part, part of some of the some of the theories about why lgbt issues why there's been this huge shift is once that sh once that ball started rolling, then you just get to a world where like, well, everybody knows someone and cares about someone who falls into that category. And once you know someone and have that personal connection, that changes how you view this, you know, you either go from you don't care about it because you don't think about it to now, well, this affects someone I care about, or maybe you were opposed to it and you've actually shifted gears. And so the question, the question is, we've only ever read like anecdotal stuff, but I would love to know to your point of if you're how, assuming that you're being raising a child in a household that's not um, welcome to LGBT issues or, or people, if you have, if a child then falls into that camp, where does that split happen? And I, I don't know, and that would be hard data to get, but really important data to get because it really tells you something about what happens. Like Rob Portman, like very famously, like, you know, is a Republican from Ohio, but then, you know, supports gay marriage because his son is gay, right? But this idea that's like, so you needed to have a son, once you had a son who was gay, you recognize like, oh, he's still my son and I still love him and he's, you know, whatever. And so, but but, but you also hear these other stories that flip, and so the flip side. So I don't know. Um, my name is Devin, and I'm the Baptist chaplain at Syracuse University. And um, uh, thank you so much for your research. I have dozens of questions, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it minimal. Um, one of the things that I was kind of curious in your research is you chart uh, somebody's religiosity based on um, their church attendance. Mm -hmm. And um, some are looking around not just how they attend, but how they choose to identify. Um, and, and so uh, research uh, that I was reading, those that do not attend but say that it's really important indicate things like prayer mm -hmm. as very high among black Protestant yeah. and white evangelical. Um, and, and so kind of flipping it on the other side is looking at their partisanship. Is some of that tracked in, in, in terms of like their participation or is it just what's on their registration card. So that's that's one question. I'm okay. Kind of so yeah, so about. so this is church attendance. I think that you're right in other places in my research I look at prayer and also religious identification and strength of identification. So um, are you uh, you know, you're a Protestant, great. Do you or you're a Baptist, do you identify strongly or like weakly, right? Or you say you're nothing, are you actually really a nothing or like if I pushed you, do you say that you're actually something? And so you can think about like that kind of scale. And the truth is it sort of it doesn't matter how you measure it. And I think that when I say it doesn't matter how you measure it, I'm not trying to be flippant. I actually think this is a limitation of survey research, which everyone sort of answers the questions sort of similarly because they interpret it as like, how religious am I or how religious do I want to be? So like, will you find some people who say they never attend church but pray five times a day on a survey? Like, sure, but not that many because for the most part, those things do track together. Not because I think that they're 
perfectly correlated, but because I think people are wearing sort of the same hats when they're answering these batteries of questions. And so they're just sort of answering things like, well, if I'm middling on my church attendance, I'm middling on my prayer, I'm middling on my identification, I'm, you know, and you just kind of give the middle questions or you're give the top, or someone might say, yeah, I don't pray super often, or maybe because it's, you know, the scales are different, right? You can pray multiple times a day, but usually you tap out on like more than once a week on church. But you just sort of say, well, I'm a really religious person. So I'm going to put the top category at all of them. Um, even if maybe saying you pray multiple times a day isn't accurate, but that's, that's a whole separate public opinion talk. That's about how we measure these things at all. And oh, the, oh, and the, and the, the partisan, like, participation? Oh, the partisan stuff. So so you can measure, I've measured it. Can um, people change? People do change. Yeah, people do change. You'd be surprised, though, about partisan identities. Like, there's just a uh, ton of, of political science research that shows that people, it's not just their party, these aren't about party registration. This is about their own party identification. And in these data, um, they do ask them multiple times and you actually see, you know, a remarkable amount of stability, you know, or to the extent that there's some variation, it might be like, oh, I go from a Democrat to an independent. Like you, you just very rarely see Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat, even over long periods of time, right? So much so that when we think about the, the Southern realignment, Southern realignment was a small amount Democrats becoming Republicans, but more about the Southern Democrats, white Southern Democrats dying and the people who replace them being white Southern Republicans. That it, even, it, even when we think about these massive tectonic shifts in the American political landscape, a fair amount of that was actually generational replacement, not from these Democrats becoming Republicans, despite the crazy changes to the political landscape in the, you know, from the 50s to the 90s in the South. One more question, yeah. if you don't mind, is, um, is what about those people who are wondering if they're even evangelical? And it's in, in my circles, it's being debated. Do we get rid of this term or do we keep it? Yeah. And um, I, I watched a debate, a good faith debate between the person who's saying it's a theological framework and another who's saying it's a political term. And if we need to ditch it, we should just, we should just yeah. ditch it. And so, so 2016, I looked at that term for myself and I said if this is how I'm going to be identified then I don't need this term yeah and I think <laughs> of that so that's actually my my kind of post books that was all like a bunch of work on white evangelicals and a lot of it was about this measurement question because even just uh, and I'll be on my like little two minute soapbox right this 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump but that's a question it's it's like for anyone who's with all the social scientists in the room it is the worst survey question ever because it's a double barrel question the question is are you a born again or evangelical Christian right so you never Never want to ask two questions at the same time. Um, and actually, when I did, I was in Alabama conducting, like, literally the person with, like, clipboards, me and a couple colleagues, uh, during the Doug Jones, Roy Moore special election in, I guess that would have been early 2018. And, you know, normally you take surveys online, and so you just click, like, yes or no. But these were pen to paper, right? And so I started noticing that people were, even though it was like, it's a, do you consider yourself a born again or evangelical? And then there was a yes or a no, and you're supposed to check a box. But people weren't checking the box. They were circling, right? And all these people were circling born again, but not, you know, and so then you start talking to people and it's like, you know what an evangelical is because it sounds like you went to seminary, right? But it's it's an academic theological decision made from on high. But now, as a, so maybe... My, my view is maybe as a academic term, it should still be included, but somewhere along the line, and the answer is 1979, Christianity Today, started asking this question and using the word evangelical that it sort of became part of the rhetoric when, you know, you have Foy Valentine saying that's a Yankee word, like Southern Baptists aren't evangelicals because it's about, it's about Northern evangelicals wanting to like band together and appear bigger than they are, right? And so it's only recently that we even, you know, anyway, and no one, and, and you talk to people, no one knows what it means outside of academic circles and even within academic circles. And so, it, but it has become this political term. And even when I was talking to people in Alabama, I would ask these questions. There are these kind of social psychological questions to kind of tap into this identity measure. And I'd say, 
you know, if, if, if you're talking, you know, when you talk about evangelicals, you say we or they or things like that, or you'd say, if someone was um, criticizing evangelicals, would you take offense to it? Because it's supposed to tap into like your group identity that's like separate from the beliefs. And this woman looked at me and was like, no, I wouldn't be offended because I know that they wouldn't be talking about me. They're talking about crazy Trumpers, right? And so that was actually her definition of like, she's basically saying, I wouldn't take offense to this term despite the fact that she herself by any theological metric is an evangelical Christian. She wouldn't take offense to it because she has internalized it as it's an evangelical label. And so I know that when they're bashing those people, that's not me. And so, yeah, so then this question of like, well, if you're, if you're, internalizing it as this political, it is synonymous with like white Christian Trump support, then yeah, maybe it's not a good term to at least be using, we shouldn't be using it journalistically and maybe it should like live in the academy of like theologians talk about it to mean something very specific. But it's messy, it's super complicated, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we have time for one more question. And before we get to the last question, I would like to take this moment to uh, personally thank uh, Bethany Wallowender and everyone in the Dean's office for all their assistance in uh, helping today happen. Uh, Maxwell Dean, David Van Slyke, and especially George and Kathy Hicker for endowing the professorship and renewing democratic community. Um, if, if there is no burning question, and I actually have one more that I, I wanted to get to. So you mentioned this as far as what might, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you about speculating for the future. And I'm gonna throw three trends at you and think how this, this might work with the life cycle theory. So we have a potential trend where this generation seems to be more strongly identified with the Democratic Party and not going away from that than previous generations, right? We, you also have the increase in secularization. And then you have this potential tectonic shift in the age cohort distribution in the United States, where after the baby boomers, the next two largest groups, uh, Gen Z and the next generation are going to become the dominant group just by numbers mm -hmm. in society. So given some of the things that you mentioned as far as people delaying marriage and having kids and the things that I just mentioned, 10 years from now, what does your theory look like? Okay. So the first one... What was the first one? The first one was the fact that this generation seems to be have a stronger oh, identification stronger with the Democratic okay. Party, yeah, and you know isn't kind of moderating with age. Yeah. So the first, the theoretically speaking, then we should see that because of politics, we should see right. I don't. There's there's you know lots of theories about secularization theory and why it's occurring, but based on the life cycle theory, we should expect consequently secularization to increase, right, or to at least remain. It's not going to go away because if these folks are Democrats, they you know either are going to be self-selecting into religious communities that work for them, right, that are that are more liberal in nature, or they're not they're gonna to continue to, to stay on the outskirts of religion and, and not, not necessarily be hostile, but not be part of a religious community. So on the one hand, I think the, the shift, the, the relationship between the young people today and, and the Democratic Party, assuming that that holds, we should start to see you know, further declines that we've already seen. And that would be hard to tease out from just like, it's already happening, but it's certainly not gonna, if we had this huge kind of Republican boon, you might say, oh, we're gonna see a, a stemming of the tide of secularization, and I don't think that we're gonna see that. Uh, the second is that rising secularization in general, right, so politics is, is one of the reasons that's happening. There's other reasons as well, maybe, you know, students being trained in the scientific, you know, scientific method more, that, that is also possible. But there's all these reasons that are going into it. And I think that like for, for the purposes of me thinking about as a political scientist, I think that's gonna matter a lot as it relates to politics. Because right, what's kind of amazing about churches is that they're supposed to bring lots of different types of people together and they're all hearing the same message. It also creates a really great way to mobilize a group, right? And so I'm not I'm not the one who said, you know, it's great that we're all in the same place three days before an election, right? That that's this great thing. But 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 people who are not religious 
they're out doing all sorts of things, right? It's not that like all the non-religious people in America are in the same non-religious place on a Sunday. They are all over the place doing all sorts of things and don't have, they haven't created, there isn't like the same community substitute. And so it's, it's harder therefore to, to mobilize around political issues, to kind of create an identity um, that, that kind of fosters a commitment to a certain set of values and beliefs and kind of getting people out the door. So I think, I think the, the political ramifications of increased secularization, which I, to point one, should continue to happen if we think that this, the younger generation is linked to the Democratic Party, um, is that it's harder, that, that, that the numbers can be shrinking on the religious side, but then you have this kind of captive base of like you're Republican and religious and so it's very easy to mobilize you even if you're smaller then you have this vast number of people where you might say oh there's a whole bunch of these people that we can tap into but tapping into them is actually really hard um, and then the third one was the cohort the different sizes mm -hmm. is that oh I don't think I, I'm, I don't want to end on like oh I don't have a good answer but I think it's I think it's complicated because yeah it's it's it, it is the the relative size of the different generations based on birth rates are just so dramatically different and so as they come up, but right right now the youngest generations aren't actually participating in politics much yet. We think that they will, right? But right now, despite the fact that they are dying off, baby boomers and even the silent generation yield an extraordinary amount of political power because they're the ones who are voting and more, more to the point, they're the ones donating money and getting campaigns starting. Like that's how we end up having the distributions that we have of who, I just saw a talk, it was actually on Japan, but just saw that America is, 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 has the third oldest of anywhere in the world, like our legislature is like the third oldest. And we have like the, num the fewest number of people under 45 serving, right? And the most number of people over 75 serving. And I think that's actually not gonna go away for that long. Um, so we'll see. All yeah. right. Well, please join me in thanking Michelle Margolis. Thank you.